at the clinical case scenario. A primary gravida mother was diagnosed to have gestational diabetes since second trimester and required insulin to maintain her blood sugars. At term, she delivered a 4.3 kg neonate who cried soon after birth. The baby was shifted to the newborn nursery where the staff nurse noticed few staring episodes followed by jerky movements of the limbs. On examination, the heart rate was 188 per minute, respiratory rate 60 per minute and blood pressure 76 by 40 millimeters of mercury. General examination showed macrosomia. So I'll just highlight what are the things here. We have a primary gravida mother who had gestational diabetes. She required insulin for sugar control. 4.3 kg macrosomic baby was delivered who seemed to have some jerky movements and vacant staring episodes. There was tachycardia, there was borderline tachypnea, BP was on the higher side. So these are the things we had in up till general examination. Now what happened in the systemic examination? CNS was normal, anterior fontanelle at level. The rest were normal. Now this is how the baby looks. You see this is a big macrosomic baby. What is the most probable diagnosis in this case? So first what will we do? We will analyze this case. So upon analysis what did we find? We found that this is a term neonate born to a diabetic mother with macrosomia and what were those jerky moments the child had with vacant staring episodes? They were neonatal seizures. So this child who is a term baby born to a gestational diabetic mother who seemed to have features of, just a, of the fact that the sugar was uncontrolled in the mother because baby is macrosomic, this baby had neonatal seizures. Now why is this and how do we analyze this? With this, the most probable diagnosis what I would analyze would be that this baby has had hypoglycemic convulsions. Why? This is because the mother has gestational diabetes. So during gestational diabetes, when the control is not adequate, the maternal hyperglycemia will cross into the placenta and cause fetal hyperglycemia because the mother's sugars are high, glucose will pass across the placenta and produce hyperglycemia in the fetus. But however, the fetus has a normal pancreas. So because the fetus has normal pancreas, the insulin secretion from the fetus is normal, unlike that of the mother, which is why she has gestational diabetes at all. So the normal fetal endocrine pancreas will produce high levels of insulin in response to the fetal hyperglycemia. This high levels of insulin will try and maintain the blood sugars in the fetus. Plus, this high level of insulin being an anabolic hormone will cause the macrosomia in the fetus. That is why the fetus grows and becomes big. Now what happens at birth? Once the baby is born, the umbilical cord is cut and there is no more flow of that high levels of sugars from the mother into the fetus. That time the baby has to maintain his or her own blood sugars, which usually due to stress the babies would have maintained. But this baby has got a high level of insulin because it has constantly been exposed to the maternal hyperglycemia. So at birth, the baby has got high levels of insulin in the blood, but the sugar inflow has been cut off when the, placent when the umbilical cord got cut. So what happens? The high levels of insulin suddenly cause crashing of the sugars and there is neonatal hypoglycemia starting up front at birth. So that is why this baby developed neonatal seizures which are hypoglycemic convulsions. So what do we do now? We will do a glucometer random blood sugar to confirm and when we did it we found that this neonates blood sugars were 22 mg per deciliter which is definitely very very low plus the child was symptomatic with hypoglycemic convulsions. Hence what is our etiological diagnosis? This is neonatal seizures due to hypoglycemia. And the hypoglycemia is because of the maternal gestational diabetes. So just for an interesting fact, this whole cycle which I explained to you, where there's maternal hyperglycemia, fetal hyperglycemia, fetal hyperinsulinemia, followed by neonatal hypoglycemia. This thing is called the Pedersen's hypothesis. And this is a commonly asked MCQ which is Pedersen's hypothesis. So with that, let's begin neonatal seizures. Neonates are at a high risk of developing seizures when compared to other age groups. 
The incidence is around 1 to 5 per thousand live births. You see, that's quite a high incidence. Clinically, what is it? Neonatal seizure is a paroxysmal alteration in the neurological function with respect to behavior, motor or autonomic function. Now, I'd like to all of you to put this question to yourselves. Why is the neonatal brain predisposed to developing seizures? Because that's how I started this introduction. It's at a high risk. So how do we answer this question? Why is the neonatal brain predisposed to having seizures? So here's the answer. The neonatal brain is always more excitable than that of the older child. Why? First, there is delayed maturation of the ATPase enzyme activity in the brain first. And when you have delayed maturation, the neonatal brain is more prone to seizures. Second, there is increased concentration of the excitatory NMDA receptors. So this is the second reason. Third, there are also increased receptors that are permeable to calcium. Now, calcium is an excitatory ion. So when you have increased receptors that are permeable to calcium, the excitability level of the neonatal brain is much higher. So this is the third cause. Fourth, there is excess glutaminergic impulses over the GABAergic impulses. Now, GABA, all of you know, is an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter, whereas glutamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. In neonates, in fact, GABA can work as an excitatory neurotransmitter also, like glutamine. Plus, you have excess glutaminergic receptors. So, all of it together gives the fourth reason why the neonatal brain is more excitable than the child brain. And all this results in, I will put all of this to her along with poor maturation. So you have poor maturation of the neonatal brain. Immature brain because it is yet to grow, you see. So that is why this poor maturation of the neonatal brain is there. And all of these reasons is what makes the neonatal brain prone to seizure activity as well as have more consequences in the term of sequelae when the seizures are either prolonged or when the seizures are persistent. So this works as a double-edged sword. One, the neonatal brain is more prone to seizure activity first. Second, if the seizure activity is prolonged or persistent, the damage occurring to the brain is also much more. So that is the reason why it is very important to diagnose and identify as well as treat neonatal seizures.